All right. So thank you for coming. And then we are now the having, uh, you know, speaker, uh, Ophi Bong uh, from London. And then he's uh, um, you know, a scholar and then, you know, the journalist who actually contributed to the many uh, media. And then he also writes about, he writes about uh, psychoanalysis and um, media theory. And he is now the teaching at uh, Digital Media at uh, you know, Royal Holloway University, London. And uh, he recently published uh, this fantastic book, you know, Dream Lovers is a uh, gamification of relationships. So uh, this inspiring book, you know, uh, gave us uh, many idea about, uh, you know, how to understand uh, today's culture. And then in particular, you know, so called uh, digital capitalism. I really want to focus on that, you know, the new accumulation, um, you know, the, by exploiting our subjectivity or so called the desire. And then I think uh, all panel on, in this, you know, lecture series quite familiar with this topic. And then we would have uh, many ideas, you know, the, after reading this book, so uh, we can exchange. Um, um, you know, the each you know, opinions about this topic. Uh, okay, just uh, I want to, you know, ask uh, the Ofi uh, about, you know, the, this book, why you wrote this book, and then why, what kind of idea, you know, did you have when uh, finished this book, something like that, and then your plan or your interest recently. So, hand over you. Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And thanks, uh, Alex, for inviting me. It's, it's really nice to, to speak um, across to Korea. Um, I, I guess, um, you know, one way of starting this is that, that, I mean, I've always been interested in psychoanalysis um, and studied psychoanalysis, did my PhD in psychoanalysis and comedy. Um, and um, but I suppose this this um, project is is a little bit different, um, and it sort of happened in a, in a sense by accident, I guess. And when I think about where, where did it start? Um, it really, really begins with two two things that happened really in the in the summer of 2016. Uh, so it's a long time ago now, like five years. And uh, one of those things was I'm sure everyone remembers this summer. Uh, so, some people called it the summer of Pokemon Go, um, because everyone was playing this video game Pokemon Go at the time. And um, I, I started to think about this, um, and it, I was in Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong at the time, uh, and. Um, there were there were some interesting things emerged about this this game uh, in relation to desire, and it's um, it became clear that they were doing like a lot of um, deals. I suppose this company um, Niantic, they're called, they were bought by Google before the release of Pokemon Go. So it's really a Google project, and they were placing certain Pokemon uh, in different places in order to test how they could move people around the city in new ways. Um, so although in the media, I'm sure you saw funny videos of like thousands of people running around trying to catch Pikachus mm -hmm. and things like this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, people were sort of reporting on the chaos of what was going on. But really, this, this wasn't chaos. Um, it was a, a sort of planned strategy on the part of Google and uh, other such companies to test out new kinds of technology which could influence the way people move around and use their cities. So, for example, in Hong Kong, where I was, the, the rarest Pokemon um, in, at the beginning is a Pokemon called a Porygon. Um, it was only available in the most expensive shopping mall in central Hong Kong. So the idea was to drive more and more people to um, these kind of areas where money can be spent and so on. Uh, also, McDonald's had a deal uh, with different pokers, poker, with to be a host of poker stops so that more people would buy a Big Mac or whatever as they played the game. So what we're looking at with something like Pokemon Go was a kind of corporate strategy to test how they could move people around the city in new ways. And of course, the Pokemon is the sort of ultimate object of desire from a digital mm. sense. So I, I started to think about the question of desire at the heart of this process. How are we being uh, edited, controlled, moved in new directions through our own desires? And, and what does that mean? The same summer I went to, I started then after that to study the, the idea of a smart city, right? Because in at the time there was a lot of 
media attention to this idea of a smart city, the, the new smooth functioning cities of the future. And I was also thinking perhaps that desire is, is, is important in understanding how these kind of smart cities are going to function. So I went to um, a place in East China called Hangzhou, uh, which is where Alibaba um, is um, uh, founded. It's where Jack Ma is from. Um, and um, I, I was able to visit this place, um, which is called uh, Cloud Town. It's like the mm -hmm. Silicon Valley style uh, hub of Alibaba's um, tech world and here they're developing something called the city brain which is considered to be one of the most uh, advanced smart city plans uh, in the world so um, I, I was being shown around all these new technologies they got some mad things there they got some traffic lights which um, count the wrinkles when you're mm -hmm. crossing the road they count the wrinkles underneath your eye and then they decide how long you're going to need to cross the road because of the number of wrinkles <laughs> and speed that you and so on but uh, they, they showed me something really interesting um and it was a car um a car that's designed by alibaba and a german company rover and uh i asked the guy what's so uh what's so special about this car and i was expecting him to say it's really fast, it looks amazing, it can never crash, it can drive itself, whatever you, whatever you think about. But he said, um, no, he said, the car knows when you're hungry and what you might like to eat before you do, right? So initially I didn't think this was so special, but actually I, I looked into it more and realized it's extremely important. So for example, you might like, um, you might like to have a bowl of ramen on Wednesday at 7 p.m. But mm. you don't really know that you want that. It's just the car, it looks in your phone, it reads your data, it, it knows you better than you know yourself. And so mm. at 6.30 p.m., the car says to you, why don't you try this new ramen place uh, mm. near to your destination or whatever? And um, when I asked them why, why they want to do this, um, the guy said, because we can... Um, uh, move people away from places that take cash as a payment method or WeChat Pay, which is owned by Tencent, and direct them towards restaurants which take Alipay, which is our own payment system. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is in a sense crazy and also not. I mean, it doesn't sound dystopian, but it's another example like Pokemon Go of how there's a corporate transformation of desire. Right. So you're being predicted and you're being nudged in, in social media studies. This is often referred to as nudging. It's when sort of Facebook or Twitter you know, pushes you in a particular direction um, uh, that you weren't necessarily going to go in. So in a sense, I, I sort of realized that we're, we're entering a new kind of world, a world of smart cities, of corporations, uh, you know, uh, of increased power being given to enormous private institutions. And one of the key ways uh, in which we're being changed into the citizens of the future, the subjects of the future, is by a reorganization of our own desires, right? So the techno these technologies are designed to, they're often called predictive technologies. It's predictive technology is the most invested in technology today. Um, it receives the highest level of investment. But really this word predictive is, uh, um, uh, uh, what's it called? A, a misdirection, because these are not really technologies which are expect are, are designed to predict what we want. They're much more designed to edit what we want or or, or change what we want, right? Mm -hmm. So they they understand us precisely in order to nudge us in different directions. So I wanted to explore this in a kind of psychoanalytic sense. What does this mean for questions of desire? Because um, of course, you know, we can say that psychoanalysis is uh, at its best, a exploration of desire. It's an exploration of um, love, f uh, affect, emotion, I guess, but things like drive, you know, things like um, pleasure, you know. So, and then of course, we also have um, an enormous, so I wanted to explore, like, what does this mean? And I think um, in a sense, this is also why I think Lacanian psychoanalysis or, and the work of Jacques Lacan is, is the most important thing to, to, to use here because of the way in which he sort of, let's say, politicizes 
desire and drive. So mm -hmm. one interesting example of that would be uh, the distinction between instinct and drive in, in Lacan's theory. So instincts, on the one hand, is like something which may even be biological. It comes within, or we might think of it as coming from within. For example, you need to eat, maybe the, the instinct to reproduce. Some people, I don't know what I think of biology, but some people would describe this as biological uh, instinct. But drive is something different. Lacan actually says, um, drive is like a kick in the ass, right? So it's something that pushes you in a certain direction. It comes from politics, culture, society, and it kicks you in the ass in a certain direction, right? And, uh, but it feels like instinct, right? So you feel like you're doing what you want, right? And, but you're not doing what you want. It, it's not instinct, it's drive. It's coming from the political, cultural, social moment in which that, which produces those desires and produces those drives. And they sort of speak through you, uh, as it were, and you get nudged in a particular direction. And this is precisely what's happening with the kinds of corporate capitalism that is interested in editing desire in certain directions. Uh, and, and pushing you in certain ways. And the, the trick is that's being played is a trick between instinct and drive because these this kind of capitalism, platform capitalism or digital capitalism or so on, it, it requires us to, to ignore the fact that these are actually not our own desires, but someone else's, but, but the desire of Alibaba or the desire of Google, right? So uh, we, are, we are increasingly living in a system where we kind of disavow uh, and ignore the fact that our drives and, des uh, and desires are increasingly political. And that, that, of course, they always have been, um, you know, there's no, I'm not, there's no past in which you know, desire was free and, and anything. But nevertheless, um, you know, so one of the things that interests me is that, of course, uh, so, so I tried to, anyway, I tried to explore this in relation to a huge, huge range of different digital things which affect desire. So the examples I just gave you, like a car, like Pokemon Go, they're very different to, I looked at things like online dating and uh, social media and sex robots and uh, virtual reality. Um, but looking at, uh, I mean, virtual, there's, there's so many examples that we, we're in, we, there are just millions of examples of different kinds of digital technology that connect to desire in different ways and, and seek to operate on us at the level of desire. So I wanted to explore in this broad sense, like how psychoanalysis can help us um, to understand the transformation that's happening here. Um, so just one last thing before I sort of um, let you guys um, talk a bit. Um, I, I don't think there's something um, fundamentally new about this. And what's interesting here is that in some ways, I could imagine somebody who doesn't like psychoanalysis so much saying that, well, if we if the subject changes, you know, if, di if digital capitalism changes us, surely that would make psychoanalysis useless. Right. Because it comes from a time uh, before these things and it describes the the way the subject is um, you know before the arrival of all these transformation uh, digital transformation of what it means to be human I think that's an interesting point uh, and we do also need to think about how to change psychoanalysis to answer this but for me um, it's not that there's something radically new happening um, so you know Lacan would would have thought of literature and film uh, as um, examples of something which transformed desire, right? So um, it's, 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 you know, in the 19th century, um, the terms of relationships and the terms of friendships were massively influenced and, and coded and controlled by the literature, the tradition of literature. You know, in the 50s and 60s, Hollywood cinema um, takes over maybe from literature. Maybe we could even say religion first and then literature and then Hollywood cinema. And these things, they all transform desire, right? So there's nothing new in itself about our desires being controlled by political forces and, and, the, and, and edited in this way. But what I would say is that now there's something new that is the main thing that tells us how to desire, that teaches us how to think, how to feel, how to love, 
how to want, how to enjoy, right? And that is a kind of digital media, a, a suite of digital media programs and algorithms. Mm -hmm. So this is the new cinema or the new literature or the new religion, right? Because it's taken over as the thing which um, dictates how we think and feel, especially when it comes to sort of mm -hmm. desire, relationships, love, sex, these kind of things. So in a sense, I just wanted to explore like what this means, what these changes are, and whether psychoanalysis can still be a helpful, useful way of kind of approaching mm. these topics. So I hope that's a good sort of summary of, of how I started doing it and, and what the book's kind of trying to do. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, so you wanna give kind of, you know, one and uh, one and all to, about this, you know, digital capitalism uh, revolving around, you know, the the category of uh, desire. And then uh, also it would uh, you know, give us some a new mode of life yeah, I think that there, there, there might be uh, several analysis of this, you know, platform capitalism. And then nowadays, actually, I prefer uh, some kind of a concept, uh, surveillance capitalism is uh, mm. now emerging. I think a little bit those, you know, term would share, you know, same uh, insight in that. So I think uh, I want to open the actual discussion to uh, our panels and then Manoji Chumei from Taiwan, Manoji from India and Joff from uh, Japan and uh, now the England. Well, just uh, any question or some comment? So you've got a very international panel. <laughs> <laughs> always, as always. Chumei, you first. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about this division between instinct and drive. Somehow it's just, it's it's kind of it doesn't really work for me i guess because because for me it's it it replicates this old binary between biology and culture and we have been talking about this uh deconstructing this yeah for so long in in feminist theory in cultural theory so I'm a little confused. Uh, how how do we approach this um, this this detect editing of our desire? That you you add the word edit uh, editing. I think it's interesting. But I'm thinking about how about the the pre the, the pre digital desire hmm. or the pre digital instinct or drives. They are all somehow already social and cultural and being yeah. detected by our parents' education, religious beliefs. So I think there are some very nuanced, I think, work operation of something there which need to be articulated more mm -hmm. than just saying that. Um, this difference between drive and instinct. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Point, I no, I, I totally agree. I mean, so mm. I, uh, when I said that, that's why I said I'm not sure what I think of biology because I think uh, mm -hmm. it's 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 not really interesting discussion, as you say, to have about this discussion about the distinction between biology and culture. Mm. Um, you know, but I, I suppose what we can say is, well, I suppose my answer to that would be leave the biology leave that to the biologists. I mean, uh, because, um, I mean, if, if they want to claim that there's, there's a natural drive, I, mean, I just, I'm not interested in that. Like clearly our, our, our feelings, our affects, um, they are so codified by cultural things that it doesn't actually matter. It doesn't make a difference really whether there's any uh, biological or instinctive aspect to them um, because whether there is or not, they are completely sort of coded within um, a kind of, so in a sense, everything, everything you can articulate, and I think this would also be the psychoanalytic position, everything you can articulate as a desire is in the category of drive, because by the time it becomes part of language and part of um, discourse, it's already been, it's already very much within 
the sort of cultural sort of realm and so on. So I think, um, you know, uh, the the question of instinct is less interesting than the question of drive or maybe can just be left uh, to the side. Um, and then, but I suppose to answer the other part of your question, like the history of this, how, what is, that is the whole challenge, I guess. You're absolutely right. Like what is um, uniquely different about digital desire exactly, right? And, you know, how can we identify um, what this, um, what this change is? Um, and it's difficult to do um, because, of course, many of the things I would want to say about digital desire today, for example, I'd want to connect it to a kind of new kind of global inequality, right? So uh, a kind of um, system where, like, let's say a 1% of people who have the power to create these kind of technologies operate as a kind of controlling class, and then everyone else operates almost like a sort of lemming uh, who doesn't see how these technologies work, but nevertheless has to live in accordance with their rules. Now that on the one hand, that feels like something particularly new. On the other hand, you could say it about the religious church, right? You could say that, uh, again, you have this small 1% of people uh, in power and the rest of the population simply kind of following. Um, so, and this is, I think, a critical question. I don't really... I, I really like um, the arguments of, like, say, Jodie Dean uh, talking about neo-feudalism uh, and how that she argues that with digital platform capitalism, we might be actually not in capitalism, but in a new form of neo-feudalism. Um, and then other people argue against that. And I think, you know, this is what we're, this is the question we're struggling with across the arts, basically, right? What, how to, how to identify, I mean, uh, as Alex mentioned, do we want to call it platform capitalism? Do we prefer surveillance capitalism? Do we want to call it neo-feudalism? Do we want to call it digital capitalism? You know, so do we want to actually say it's not capitalism, it's something else? You know, so this is, this is not like a, a question I can easily answer, but I think what we're seeing here is we are really grappling as, as a, at all, you know, journalists, philosophers, academics, really kind of grappling with how to sort of identify what's what's continued and what's different because on the one hand we can see this is still a form of capitalism and the patterns of exploitation and so on can be see, can be traced back through different forms um you know on the other hand we are kind of aware that there is something unique and new about this form of the digital and i suppose yeah i suppose my attempt was to say that perhaps what's changed is something to do with desire right so the the structure uh, what is particularly different about the digital to um, those past versions of capitalism, let's say, is perhaps something to do with the way we desire and, and the, it, within this system. But, you know, there might be also different answers to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually, exactly. And, uh, you know, the, but, the, you know, you put a very interesting idea about, you know, the relationship between um, desire and then the capitalism you have to put a kind of attraction you know is a um, kind of uh, the love you know love is a little bit you know the works there is kind of a mechanism is a uh, capitalism also used you know kind of uh, that sort of attraction of love you know mm. it means actually that if you want to exploit the subjectivity or some uh, desire, you need actually to create such a very seductive object. As Walter mm. Benjamin already, you know, the pointed out, you know, the commodity is like a prostitute, you know, something like that. So it's always uh, is uh, um, the correlated with that kind of seduction. Yeah, you know? and I think, I think, you know, when you're saying that, I think of um, Todd McGowan's book, really, Capitalism mm. and Desire, you know, yeah. where he talks about the, the, the promise of fulfillment, I guess, is at the center of this. Like, what's, what's happening here is, yeah, it's it's capitalism is absolutely not trying to fulfill uh, your desire, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it it pretends that it's offering, it pretends that it's trying to, and and so this is what happens with like, uh, for example, with dating apps. You know, there, there's one I don't know if you have it uh, in Asia. It's probably not actually. It's called Hinge, but the marketing campaign for this is the app that's designed to be deleted. Now, this is quite funny because, of course, no app would be designed to be deleted, right? Because this is not how companies function. Yeah, so, uh, but but it really embodies this. Of course, the, the dating apps, they don't want you to 
find a partner, right? They want you to go in an endless cycle of failure and repetition so that that program is, can sustain itself and be successful. Right. So uh, this is also in a, a kind of microcosm of how capitalism and desire function. Right. It, it has to be unfulfilling, but seem like it's going to be fulfilling uh, in order to function. So you you end up in this kind of endless cycles. So now, obviously, that is something that's been long been a history of capitalism, but now it's been sort of inherited by um, those algorithms. And I think this is this is an important point, I think, that we are now all of a sudden in the last 10 years we're outsourcing a lot of decision making to algorithms right and that could be something like a self-driving car or it could be who to go on a date with or it could be what to have for dinner or what to do tomorrow right but the thing is and so those algorithms they they are based on our desires but they're also based on a capitalist logic of desire what we're talking about here, right? So when we create these things and decide to put faith and trust in a series of algorithms that have inherited a capitalist logic of desire, we're basically agreeing to, to go into that future uncritically uh, and, and to live and to continue uh, within that kind of capitalist logic of desire that those apps are built on the basis of. Mm. I think, Chop, you would have some words about this? Yeah. Um... Uh, thanks uh, for letting me, uh, you know, uh, read your book. It was, uh, I did. It was great to read it um, last week already. Uh, so I'm just catching up on my notes now because, you know, time passes. But I, uh, <clears throat> when I read the book, I got uh, confused. And I continue with Chung Mei's point, really, about about the, the drives and, uh, and the impulses. And I got confused between, like, desire. I, desire is predominant in the book but then what's the difference between desire and, and pleasure and uh, you invoked the idea of, of love that, that the taekwondo did so then there's a, com a confusion really between what desire is and pleasure is what the drives are what yeah. the libido is what enjoyment is satisfaction and um what emotion is and then um and what perversion is so i think perversion seems to be um, lacking in, in the book because you do talk about libido like looking for the kind of a search for libido for like progressives which is something which we can uh, perhaps uh, touch upon uh, later but I got so I was listening to what you know what Chung Mei has said about, about and what you said about about the drives and what natural drives are and you said perhaps that distinction no longer works but I actually you say you're not interested in that but I am I'm interested in in the drives, in natural drives, and what because I found that the book was missing a concept of sublimation. That's what I think mm -hmm. I picked up upon, and uh, why I'm saying that is because I'm interested in in the drives because and because you mentioned people like Stiegler and uh, Han Byung Chun, so then it kind of it came to my mind as reading it. So that I think that like for me, like the idea, like the when the drives, this is Stiegler's kind of, you know, orthodoxy, but when the drives become delinked from desire, this is disaster for society because then the de desires can act out uh, their natural incl inclinations, which is, you know, can turn violent and we can't have a society which is uh, anti-social. Uh, so I found that perhaps that would be interesting for you to, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps uh, get to... Uh, talk about really so I think you know for me this idea of the engineering of desires or the editing of desires is a total uh, disaster it's a total horror for me because that means that the idea of dreams are given over um, are given over to other people to to manufacture and then yeah. from this idea that you know this idea of an, without sublimation or without, without dream there's no then the question is, what is a relationship? You see, so there's no going over to the other. This is Han Byung Chul's precise point. So then, the idea of love is, you know, this is a total disaster for the idea of a love and you know a care for the other. And then this is disaster for desire. Okay, that's yeah. my that was my first point. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I think it is um, though. Um, 
I think it is a disaster for desire. Um, and I, I, I take the point about sublimation as well. I think, I think for me, I mean, for example, I, I would want to talk about like video games and sublimation. I think that would be the interesting way to think about this or virtual reality and so on, because, you know, in a sense, this is precisely what's happening. Right. And, and I think your, your point is, is right. That there's a, there's some kind of, um, yeah, I mean, it, you want, yeah, I want to sort of follow the point about, um, it, it being a disaster for society if drives are separated from instincts, um, you know, and, and yeah, it occurs to me that this could explain um, outbursts of violence in contemporary society um, to a certain extent, like when, when there's real life violence and so on, um, you know, mass shootings, etc. Uh, it's quite possible that what's going on there is something like a separation of um, desire and instincts. But a drive and instinct, sorry. But um, but the, the question about love and all that, I, I, I do want to think about that. Um, and um, I, I mean, I, I, I just feel that, okay, so although I agree that this, this um, is a kind of, yeah, it does, in, in a sense, there is a sort of um, problem in that this makes love as fidelity or solidarity kind of impossible. Um, so I haven't really, but there are so many, I mean, I suppose my answer is really simple. There are so many um, discussions which have tried to sort of separate love and desire. And the, the main drive for doing so is to create a kind of um, bad and good desire. So, uh, or bad and good, whatever you, these categories tend to work this way. So, I mean, there, a good book on this in psychoanalytic terms is um, Laurent Balant's book, Love Slash Desire, or Srechko Horvat's uh, really interesting book, The Radicality of Love, which tries to sort of argue for, you know, there's falling in love on the one hand, which is bad, and then there's love on the other hand, which is good, a kind of communist solidarity, whatever. Uh, you know, I, I, I think this is a useful way of thinking, but it's also not always good to try and do this kind of good bad separation when it comes to love desire and these discussions and so on um you know and i i I've, one of the things that i found really interesting was this um this quotation from freud um from um group psychology um where he he actually says um you know we we use love this word love uh in quite different ways we use it to mean sexual love he says we use the, the same name to, to talk about self-love, um, the same to talk about love for parents or children, uh, love for humanity. And we also use it to describe devotion to concrete objects and to abstract ideas. And he says that, that language has carried out a justifiable piece of unification in creating the word love with its numerous uses. Now, that I find very, very interesting because he's basically saying that it's not a coincidence at all that we use love in this kind of very casual almost throwaway sense you say i love my new pair of nike trainers you can also love your wife you can also love your your mother uh, you can also love philosophy and and these are extremely different things but there is something tying them together and the accident of us using that word to speak about them has kind of accidentally pointed to some odd connection between the way in which we relate structurally to these things so one of the things I, I sort of deliberately wanted to do was not uh, get into a kind of um, definition of different things, the start of your question. Loves here, desires here, drives here, instincts here, because I think that there is, that, there is obviously value, but people have done that. Like what I think hasn't been done is taking seriously the similarities between things. So in a sense, I'm saying your wife is similar to a Pikachu or a bowl of noodles. Right. Like what's in, and what's what's actually sometimes important is the similarity rather than the difference. Now, it can teach us something about how we relate to objects of desire. So the fact that we've got a Tinder for food, there's a restaurant app, for example, where it's like different meals and you swipe left and right. So it's, it's taken the format of Tinder and applied it to food. The fact that Grindr and Pokemon Go have the same kind of uh, location based operating system. So you can you can find sex or you can find a Pokemon and there's a connection between these things that this is what I wanted to take seriously like the, the the way in which these things are not separate rather than the way in which they are now that doesn't really mean that your wife is the same as some noodles you know but it, it does mean that there is something psychoanalytically interesting about looking at the connections between the objects of desire right and and, and that doesn't have to be like ignoring all the differences and all the um, specificities but 
nevertheless, you know, the technology kind of wants us to think in this way. So we need to sort of see that it does. But anyway, uh, so, oh, um, <clears throat> but, but I agree with, with what you said, uh, for sure. And I think that it does leave this big problem. Uh, and you, you were right to say, um, should the left take this seriously at all kind of thing? You know, or or but because um, or is it like something we should resist, right? Um, but I suppose my feeling is these patterns of capitalism and this technology is here whether we like it or not. So if we don't take part in it, we'll just kind of be left behind, I guess. Mm. So anyway, that's not an answer to all of what you said, which is really really interesting. Just a few thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I I'll let me just finish, okay? Because mm -hmm. I'll tell my wife what you said about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, time. The, 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 the point is that uh, um, uh, I disagree with that actually. Like this, the conflation between a different kind of like the pleasures and satisfactions are inducing them to, to what love is, because I don't think love uh, can be like predicted. Uh, like the algorithms uh, claim to, uh, like as you, the argument you said about the, 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 the car in China, I don't think you can predict it or forecast it, okay, or anticipate it, because, if, because, uh, because desire of the, the dream, that's, that's where the singularity comes from, that's which cannot be anticipated by the algorithm. That, that means that the love has to be separated out uh, from that. And once capitalism claims to do that, that's just part of marketism, marketing and consumerism. But love is co completely different from that. It's very, I like, sound like quite old fashioned uh, a position, but I think there's something in that. So anyway. No, I, I don't disagree with that though. I, I, I don't think that capitalism is able to predict. Um, I think there are, of course, aspects of love, desire, whatever, which escape these mechanisms of prediction absolutely i do uh, and that those can be that can be good and that's the the cracks in this system and there though can those can be critical important moments yeah I, I'm, I'm just focusing on the alarming extent to which we can be predicted right notwithstanding the fact that there are some things that can't be but because clearly we are um so many of our desires and things we feel attached to our music tastes our movies you know, our taste buds and how they respond to food are all edited by these, this digital world in which we live. You know, an avocado does not taste the same before Instagram and after Instagram, for example. You know, I do believe that. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in exploring the striking ways. I mean, Freud also said things like that, you know, taste and smell are the most ideological of the senses, right? So, you know, these things which appear to us as, as personal um, physical responses can also be part of, of being changed. So I, I agree with you that some things escape this kind of um, prediction, but I think we also should pay attention to the alarming ways in which some things don't escape this prediction, yeah. Uh, that is uh, actually the the apparatus of a capture, you know. Always uh, capitalism, you know, continuously invent the kind of uh, the capture machine. Yeah, yeah, the, right. That's what I'm saying. So the police are actually surveillance capitalism is uh, coined by uh, Shushana Jibop, and then uh, yeah. actually the same title book uh, discussed that you know kind of a, some sort of affordability, you know, actually the upper behavior. It means that they, uh, the capitalism does not, you know, the aim at um, creating the, you know, the kind uh, that does not actually aim at you know, controlling our desire, but, you know, the try to induce our desire to, you know, desire some object. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I that is that's... actually the, the mechanism of surveillance capitalism. That means that, uh, Surveillance is not you know, given by some big brother, but our own, you know, yeah. the self. It's not actually it, quite different from the subjectivity or some different from uh, our desire. It's a kind of self. It means uh, well trained, and then you know that that is edited, you know, the some image of a self. Definitely, I think uh, 
that's why I'm, you're saying, uh, you know, the editing desire is, I think, definitely related to self in Foucauldian sense, mm. you know, the self developing sense, or capitalist self, or today's might be called the Elon Musk and then, you know, Steve Jobs and the bourgeois self is a kind mm. of ideal model of an individual in capitalism. Mm. So I think actually this is surveillance capitalism. Uh, try to uh, you know induce us to the kind of a self surveillance is a where some machine enslavement where voluntary obedience, and then uh, so uh, that people uh, don't like uh, have you know the some kind of freedom to choose as Slavojinic said you know the people yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no want to be free yeah. the, they want to actually let you know the you know let a kind of right to choose or some. Uh, you know, such a desire to choose to uh, some kind of uh, objective mechanism. That is, might be machine. And then uh, Google <laughs> and then Facebook, you know, Twitter, you know, choose. In for instance, Netflix, you know, they choose, oh, right. they choose actually to, instead of us. Yeah, I mean, like your yeah, your your article on on the Netflix algorithms is is exactly this kind of thing. And I think your first point is important to just to sort of re repeat that. I mean, the, from the Zuboff um, stuff that you know. For a long time, there was this idea that capitalism is stopping us getting what we want, mm. um, like or or, or or society was was um, yeah, and and this is embedded in certain aspects of psychoanalysis, right? Even in in sublimation, that mm. what we want has to be has to be limited in order for us to live socially, right? Well, that that's true to, to in one sense, but in other sense, capitalism functions precisely by getting us to desire, right? It's the sort of raw desire is the sort of raw material. Uh, of capitalism it needs that the fuel right to sort of run off um so i mean that's extremely interesting and i, I don't know i mean I, I also really liked that um uh, joff mentioned stiegler i also really liked uh, the book peak libido um by dominic petman you know and this question of like what's happening here like because people are having less sex than ever but more desire than ever so like what the hell you know is going on with this particular kind of capitalism and how it like yeah puts our desires to work for itself you know that's that's extremely interesting and i think you can even see that in in workplace technologies you know you can see a gamification of work i mean this is something i haven't mentioned is this term gamification but you know and i think it's interesting like we, uh, in relation to um chun may's point you know what's the difference between gamification and commodification for example like in a sense gamification is the new digital form of commodification or something like that it's like but but you can see like even workplaces bringing in gamifying elements of stuff because pleasure maybe or, or desire then they have to be embedded in everything so you know they're, they're just they've become part of how we are told to behave and, and how capitalism encourages us to behave and and experience life so yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, uh, it's extremely interesting, and, and I mean, you connected it, Alex, to interpassivity, which I think is also yeah. a, a, a a valid thing to do. Um, you know, it's like Twitter collects the points for you, so you can just <laughs> sit back or something. <coughs> but yeah, I, d I definitely think it's. Um, yeah, I mean, it's th this book is in no way answering these questions, but it's, it's just kind of starting the conversation, really. <laughs> <clears throat> we didn't know the answer to we should actually uh, raise a question that is i think the our role right <laughs> so manoji yes um, thanks alfie for this book uh it's actually very interesting uh it took us to the intricate in very intricate functioning of liberal economy in surveillance capitalism and all and also exposes the politics of desire in an informational capitalism so since it has the axis, like, you know, the pillars of technology, design and politics is the main important axis in which you kind of build your argument. And at the same time, you talk about philosophy, sorry, psychoanalysis, Marxism and feminism is something we should come together. I think these combinations are not new, as you mentioned in the book itself, like, you know, after uh, Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse or other theoreticians, those who have used this before. My question is, like, since you are talking about the politics of desire and regaining the desire from the clutches of capitalism. Uh, in that, uh, it's sort of a liberatory paradigm to kind of liberate desire from the clutches of capitalism. Why Lacan for that matter? Like, especially uh, 
like I was going towards the Lucian, I mean, like there are certain references to Deleuze in the book, but I was wondering why, uh, why it's so much insistence on Lekan in that sense. And mm -hmm. how do you methodologically explain it? That's one question. Can yeah. I pose one question? Yeah, no, go, of course. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so the second one would be the question you are talking about, like, you know, uh, the mediating power of technology, the relation between the subject and object, like, you know, it's an age-old philosophical question and uh, technology as a mediating thing. And you're you are talking about, like, you know, as it is, as, as in Panacea, like, you don't have to get off the grid of technology. You have to stay inside the technology and kind of reappropriate it, in a sense. Like, uh, I was reminded of Heidegger's argument, like, you know, he talks about the anthropomorphic definition of technology, and then you have instrumental view of definition of technology or something. Where is it like uh, going like in a direction where in which uh, you say there is uh, an instrumentality of technology that you are uh, that you are uh, talking about, like using technology as or like you know using technology to get out of this larger surveillance or the apparatus of capture employed by the technology or else like on another way like you know in the lucian sense you you won't be able to find a place within this like you know it's like a a mold modulating like an apparatus of capture where you cannot find an outside space there is always an inside i don't know whether there is an outside at all like so you have to uh, like operate from within in order to find a way out mm. i would like to your, your sort of responses to this yeah interesting yeah um <clears throat> right yeah okay so i suppose i'll answer yeah they, they are in some ways related questions actually but um yeah i mean as for the lacan question i mean as i was sort of saying in the uh, a, a bit ago um one of the things i think is critical is to see the um politics the, the, the way in which politics writes itself into we could say the body, if we wanted to think about like Foucault or into mental health, if like maybe um, thinking of the work of Mark Fisher, you know, whose work really shows how uh, political things write, write, their, write their history into individuals' mental health. Um, you know, Foucault talks about writing, politics write, writing themselves into the body. And I think Lacan um, is, is, is interested in this similar kind of st structure of approach. It's more like, how does politics write itself into desire. Um, so this is like why I, I think this is important. And I especially would say that in our society today, digitally especially, we suffer from a kind of self-help um, focus on the personal. Um, so, I mean, of course there are lots of, it's not entirely digital. I mean, somebody like Jordan Peterson is an interesting example of this, <clears throat> but self-help in general, um, you know, except for example, a, a wearable, you know, like an Apple watch or a Fitbit, I see this as a kind of mini Jordan Peterson that lives on your wrist. And it's like telling you, get more sleep, clean your room. You need to go for a run. How many steps have you done? You know, uh, and, and what this does is it, it takes the problems of capitalism and it puts it onto the individual and makes it the individual's responsibility to deal with those things and, and think about coping within the capitalist system. Um, so I think what um, a Lacanian approach, which would also be like a kind of Mark Fisher kind of approach, which would in some ways be like a Foucault kind of approach, <coughs> what it does is <coughs> attempts to kind of reverse that mm. so that instead of looking at our bodies, our desires, our, um, uh, you know, our mental health and saying we can now we can now see that as a symptom of the political conditions of capitalism and so on rather than turning the political conditions of capitalism into a personal problem we're turning our personal problems into symptoms of the political conditions of capitalism and that i think could be important from say socialist or you know organizing perspective in 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 making sure the focus is on systemic and structural change rather than um you know individual change now what for example would a deleuzean approach to that look like it's difficult to answer, but I would say it would, yeah. I mean, so, okay, so, and this, this I think maybe comes into your second question. Like, how do we es use this technology? How do we escape from it? Or should we be using it from within and so on? Um, now, obviously, you know, my view is that there's a kind of weird escapism in 
you know, opting out of it and going back to nature and things like that. So I think we do need to use it. And I think we, this sounds more controversial, maybe, I think we need to actively reprogram desire. So I, th- and so I, I would say that a Deleuzean approach, now this is not really my area of expertise, but it lends itself more to the idea that we should escape from the restrictions that are placed on desire, right? Into kind of the territorializing flows or rhizomatic kind of, uh, you know, structures and stuff. Um, whereas I think I'm, I'm interested in the, how structural, you know, psychoanalysis is, right? It's like, you know, here's the capitalist discourse, here's the university discourse, here's the master's discourse. L- ha- what kind of structure of desire would we like to, to design. Now, I don't have the answer to that, but I think that's a question that we should be working on, right? Whereas a Deleuzean approach cert- tends more into a kind of infinite proliferation, queerness, uh, you know, multiple um, d- uh, overlapping desires and so on, which I think has its, has its place, but I think we also need to be more structural about it. How do we want desire to work? How, what would it look like? What kind of structures of desire could we potentially imagine and create uh, in a, in a, that would be part of a sort of non-capitalist future, let's say? But that, that's not a great answer because I don't know the answer, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it explains why I feel drawn to um, Lacanian psychoanalysis, I think, as a as a tool. What do you think about the Deleuze question? I mean, no, actually, I was thinking more in the sense of uh, like, uh, especially in the context of psychoanalysis, and Marxism, and all, right? You know, the most recent approach is uh, that of the Deleuze and Guattari in anti Oedipus and all. I was thinking about that, but also at the same time, uh, in terms of uh, sort of a political uh action and how far it is uh like and in what way it can be reconfigured uh, like you know it helps us in understanding these things but i don't know what the plan of action could be like if if there has to be a kind of a liberation from the um like in in terms of uh political liberation so yeah i was mm. so cu- i was so curious about like yeah, uh, no, you, but but Deleuze also talk, talks about like uh, functioning of a productive and generative affirmation of life, like you know, taking the desire from the larger negative construction of lack in in that sort of uh, connection. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. I wonder, and I, again, I don't know the answer, but I'm wondering whether liberation is a term we'd want here. Like, do do we want uh, to to be liberated from these? structures or do we want ourselves to edit them or mm. or, or create a new one I, and i guess yeah i mean i guess communism doesn't mean freedom right <laughs> I, I don't know it's a difficult question <laughs> some point it might be freedom but uh, you know yeah maybe but some, <laughs> some, sometimes uh, people uh, understand uh, communism as kind of uh, liberty you know but yeah. uh, the absolute state of liberty. But uh, I think it comes in more close to freedom in Hegelian sense. That's what I'm mm. saying. Joff. Uh, uh, yeah, so just uh, you talk about like liberation of desire. So um, I guess I should kind of confess because part of my kind of research project last few years is to get back to Wilhelm Reich and mm. Uh, mm. To, to read him properly. I mean, not to read him like some kind of some kind of refrain of, uh, you know, desire, desire, and it's repression, all that kind of thing that nobody else knows anything about other than that. You know, if you ask the delusions, they just never get past that because they never read uh, people like uh, Reich or people like, um, you know, Adi Lang, or they just don't, people just don't do it. They jump to Lacan. So I might do a bit of Lacan bashing in a moment, okay? But um, I was I was thinking about, the model of desire again and it seemed to me one of the questions that came up when i was reading your book was like is like the model of desire universal because you you talked about japan mm. a lot now, i live in japan so i kind of you know i have my own kind of uh, um, my own kind of uh, schizophrenia towards, towards japan right so um i was wondering like what is it is it like a western model of desire is it like a japanese model of desire okay yeah. so there was that. And then, of course, in Japan, and Guattari is kind of my, um, 
like my interest because mm-hmm. Guattari has a kind of uh, he has one one hand he has a kind of stupid romanticized vision of Japan right like a tourist fantasy and then he also has a more critical kind of perspective on what he calls diabolical capitalism okay the Japan is a kind of form of diabolical uh, capitalism and of course Japan has real problems with uh, the social recluse okay uh, the the people who withdraw from society. So in one way, you know, you could say like Japan and increasing places like Korea are kind of autistic societies, okay? And again, go back to this idea that that's a disaster of desire. I mean, the hikikomori, uh, the social recluse, is a disaster of desire. There's no political response to that, okay? Now, in Lacan's case, when he talks about Japan, he, whether he's being facetious or not, he says like the, the, the way that the Japanese unconscious is structured like it's di- the different language means it's inaccessible right so that's kind of might be interesting to think about the diabolical nature of Japanese capitalism and the fact that the Japanese unconscious is inaccessible to but a psychoanalysis can't kind of access that so I was thinking about that but I mean if it like going back to yeah I should really say that so going back to like Manoji's point about the politics desire one answer to that is not Lacan, okay? Um, because I, when I read the book, I was coming away that the, the subject is really very, very passive and it's, on, it's somehow unable to construct desire. As, as you say, something like desire is perhaps entirely constructed by digital processes, okay? So, I mean, whether we can maybe get to that, okay? But I'm, I was quite sure if that's what you mean, but whether the subject is able to engineer or construct desires, okay. Now, in the, and you, that's important for you because when I read your book, this is about how to reorganize or you said today, the editing, okay. The relationship between the subject and the, I guess, um, what is it, the partial drives, right, in Lacan or something, and, in, and how to do that with a pro- progressive politics, okay. Now, so, like the delusion answer to the politics of desire is that, and you mentioned the avocado and whether like Instagram makes you desire it or not, right? Now, the delusion point is that desire is part of an arrangement of desire. You kind of in- construct desire. You, you put things into play and you experiment to see how they work. And that means to take a risk, okay, in the arrangements of desire. So like a desire, uh, avocado might be part of a, a meal with a, a beautiful a person you, you want to be with and then you've got the the romance of it you've got the uh, the mm. atmosphere of a place and things like that and that's arranging a desire in a very in a productive and experimental way so i think that one way to think about policy desire from the losing point of view is, is to see it's like an engineering problem of arrangement of desire yeah. so i mean it's kind of scattered thoughts there but i'd love to hear your ideas about them no, I, I think that's really, really interesting. I mean, I, I saw so many different things there. I mean, I, I have a good friend working on Reich. I think there's so much to be done with that. Um, so, um, I mean, the, the, the question of, um, sorry, what, what was I going to talk about there? I, 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 the first thing was the West, the question about Western and Japanese desire, or, or is this a universal desire? So I think this is a really um, critical point. Because um, obviously, I'm, I'm I'm fully aware of the history of criticizing psychoanalysis for um, applying a model of desire, which is let's say Western or we could say patriarchal, as if you it's universal. Um, I, I think, and and I I think uh, I'm more inspired inspired influenced by um, arguments of Mladen Dola to a lesser extent Zizek on this question, and I, I think um, one of the, but I think that it's possible that desire can be the only left thing left that's universal in a world of identities you know so one of the things i found incredible when i tried to take some of these technologies seriously was how easy it is to actually enjoy so when i went to a sex robot brothel for example this was not something i thought i was gonna take any kind of pleasure out of but once there inside its own structure inside the scene of this, 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 this desire. It's possible to take up uh, this position, the subject position of the desiring subject and experience desire within that structure, right? Whatever, however simulated that might be. 
The same could be said of virtual reality, pornography and so on. But the same could be said of video games and things like this. When, when you shoot someone in the head with a sniper rifle in a video game, this is not because you desire to get a sniper rifle and shoot someone in the head, but because the game allows you to take up the desiring position of wanting to do that. And, and therefore, is a, you are able to generate pleasure by uh, taking up that position and following through on that desire. So in this sense, you know, and I tried to use Mladen Dola's arguments about ventriloquism, that basically when you're desiring in these systems, you're, you're, it's, a ven it's a question of ventriloquism. You're, you are the, 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 the puppet and the desire is running through you. And in this sense, I think desire could be a mechanism for solidarity across identity categories, right? Whether you're gay, straight, trans, non-binary, male, female, Japanese, American, English, you can enter the scene of desire and occupy the subject position, the desiring position of anyone else. So in, in that sense, we could say that these things are universal. We can all, every single one of us, enjoy shooting someone in the head with a sniper rifle. And that means, even though we like to criticize these things and say how bad that is to do, that shows a possibility for solidarity across identity categories. In a society, can I say, that is absolutely obsessed with separating us off from each other and saying, look, Westerners are different to Easterners, men are different to women and so on. And, and you know, the technology itself tries to do this. Um, so for example, with dating apps, we get things like Trump.dating. The whole idea is put all the Trump supporters together. You know, you get something like OK Comrade, which is being produced now, you know, put all the, the, the socialists together. Then you get, you know, ones for bourgeois people, ones for younger people. And so the, the technology is trying to make desire not universal, right? To separate us off from each other into our identity categories gay, straight, male, female, you know, Chinese, British, whatever. But actually the way the desire functions through us could be a possibility for a kind of international solidarity, I would say. So that, that's like one answer to this question about West, the West, the East and male, female. It comes up a lot with these things. Um, so uh, yeah, okay, so that was part of what you said. But then, I mean, I, I, I totally um, fascinated by what you said about Deleuze and questions of programming and editing desire um you know i would like to just read a bit more about that i think that sounds yeah possibly a problem for some of the things that i've been saying but also really quite interesting to to think about um so yeah i mean i just don't know so much um about this question but um yeah maybe you could actually send me where to read those arguments of Deleuze because I wouldn't mind uh, kind of exploring that um, a little bit more. Um, I certainly think the question of div the individual and so on which is kind of popular in media studies is important for that because there it's like this is the other thing where Lacan probably hmm, maybe Deleuze is better than Lacan on this like to a certain extent you're expected to reset your desire like each time so like you spend one minute uh, doing you know, one thing and then the next doing another thing. You're, you're not expected to have a continuity there. You're, you're expected to have a kind of rupture between each one. So like five minutes on Deliveroo, five minutes on Candy Crush, then you play a video game. And each time you sort of start from zero, uh, which seems to be something more Deleuzean um, and that would not, mm, yeah, would not necessarily be the case of psychoanalysis. But yeah, no, I, I just don't know uh, those things, but would love to read them. <clears throat> Yeah, actually, it, uh, we would say uh, there might be a fundamental difference uh, between Lacan and Deleuze. Actually, my opinion is a little bit different because uh, we're talking about desire, but things that uh, we should uh, presuppose, you know, the concept unconscious before uh, discussing this concept of desire, you know. So Lacan, both Lacan and Deleuze, uh, in my opinion, the uh, they borrowed, you know, that kind of a concept, you know, the, from the Freud, but, uh, you know, not really actually the, uh, went on to the, you know, Freudian, you know, fundamentalism, but rather, you know, they reinterpret, you know, this concept through a lens of a Spinoza. I think this, this is uh, actually, you know, very important, you know, the reinterpretation, in my opinion, the kind of renovation of a psychoanalysis. So, um, that's why just I'm saying actually the, to some point, you know, Deleuze also tried to uh, renovate or some uh, reformulate, you know, psychoanalytic uh, theorems and then uh, 
in terms of a politics. That's why actually the, I'm really impressed by your argument. Yeah. And then these days, actually, you know, the lots of us similar, you know, the argument about, you know, the relationship between politics and psychoanalysis and the Ian Parker mm. as well. And then and now the desire of a psychoanalysis, you know, Gabriel, uh, who's that? Uh, uh, Gabriel also, you know, the, the Brazil, you know, he also the talk about uh, how, you know, the psychoanalysis can meet, you know, the politics. He's an activist and the psychoanalyst, Laconia psychoanalyst in Brazil. I think what he's actually the argue is quite definitely and the uh, uh, return of that kind of topic, which was very attractive, you know, actually many uh, activists in France, you know, in in 1960s, you know, Gattari, for instance, you know, Felix Gattari in particular, he tried to practice, you know, some sort of a, such a radical, red clinic, you know, yeah. in France. And then I think the we need to uh, pay attention to this kind of uh, the, the the practice of psychoanalysis. You know, in my in my concept, it might be called uh, you know actualization of psychoanalysis. You know, we would have different theory. For instance, actually, we have a gravity theory and we have you know quantum physics, quantum mechanics. But if you want to shoot in a rocket for actually the unloading of that kind of satellite, we need uh, actually two theory. You know, in the in the process of such actualization. That's, uh, I think, you know, the, if you're talking about, uh, if we are talking about the politics of something, politics of psychoanalysis or politics of philosophy, I think that we should actually more, you know, focused on this actualization. And then uh, now that actually we talk about, okay, Lacan, you know, that we cannot analyze the Japanese. Okay, it might be a nonsense, you know, because he didn't know, you know, the, the, this kind of a world we live today. <laughs> Those you know theorists in 1960s, of course, they anticipated a lot, mm. but uh, they didn't have this kind of experience. You know, we we live in a totally globalized world, and then uh, whatever called you know digital capitalism, you know platform mm. capitalism, surveillance capitalism emerged from this kind of globalization. You know, in my opinion, so uh, uh, this is very important. New actual situation, a new world, you know, in which the, we are to you know the correlate to each other and then uh, that means we would have different desire you know yeah yeah i agree and and i think also just very quickly on that point um what is important about um these critical theorists from the 60s whether that's Deleuze or Lacan is that they allow us a way of contextualizing how how things have changed and how we can process our present in relation to that that's the in a way that's the opposite some people use them as masters to explain the present you know by saying that you know what we can see in today's society simply proves Deleuze was right or Lacan was right no that's totally the wrong way of uh, approaching that like the fact that they are outdated makes it more valuable to mm. talk about desire today in relation to their models of desire in Lacan and Deleuze because it allows us to work through ourselves what we think is unique, what we think fits, what we think doesn't fit, what we think has changed. So like the argument that these theorists don't understand Japan actually is, is, is the wrong way around. It's, it's more like perhaps they're more useful to understand Japan than they are to understand France, yeah, right? Exactly. Because it allows you to think about what is the what are the models here and how do they relate to each other and so on. And so the fa again, the fact that, so this is also an easy reply if somebody says that, you know, you're using somebody who, who was from before the digital age. Well, it's precisely interesting to do that, right? Mm. To see what comes of those different yeah. models. Yeah. Anybody? To me. Yeah, you kind of lost me when you talk about solidarity. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, how is that solidarity that we, you know, separately in front of our PC or those scream and shooting some imaginary mm -hmm. asshole or, or, or what. How is that solidarity that I don't understand? And so that's why I, I want to talk about actual, I want to talk about the power of body, you know, because there are actual people, actual bodies, suffering, um, feelings, and wanting. I don't want to talk about desiring because I don't know what is desire anymore. But I know <laughs> we as bodies, right? 
we fear and we suffer and we want something. We don't really know what we want, but we always feel this urge. So this, this, this um, led me to the point of, uh, you talk about, um, and this also related to uh, Job's question about your progressive politics. You talk about this collective progressive imagination, right? And, and you talk about progressive project of uh, um, maybe to create a new digital culture versus that conservative and Trump version of that. Um, but I, I think when, when I look at the term collective desire, it then means think about uh, the, the, the classical Marxist question of collective consciousness all over again, because you know, it's a very controversial concept, collective consciousness. How is that possible when we can only be conscious about something or our situation as, as a real bodily self? I mean, mm. the, of course, the concept of individuality is, is questionable and, and ha have many layers, but so that's why I want to return to we as a being with body, bodily self, body, whatever, even if we take um, the, the position of subject at maybe a capitalist desire, theme of desire, we are, we still we are still subjects with bodies. Yeah. So this body question, I, I'm I'm thinking. So I, I want to know what you have things to say about that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is something. It is something I I, I get asked a lot actually. Mm. Um, and I suppose I would say that. Well, I mean, my um my sort of um the the history of my feeling that there's a digital commons. Um, that can be recovered is is part of a long history of the internet and you know in the in the late 90s and early 2000s there was enormous hope um, that the internet would produce a new form of commons a kind of you know world without scarcity and that the digital object would be a kind of infinite thing um, which would um, you know which would allow us to create, a, a, it, I mean, people believe this would be finally democracy realizing itself. Finally, we would have a kind of international cross borders, cross cultural commons uh, through which people could share. On top of that, it wouldn't have any scarcity because by virtue of being digital, it can be infinitely reproduced and so on. And so you get this idea of a kind of new kind of collaborative commons of mass production, so on, which, you know, would have, which people thought would have been was going to be a sort of enormous opportunity for international movements of solidarity and so on. Then, like, you know, around the uh, mid 2000s, this all this space all gets totally shut down by a kind of new copyright laws, uh, private ownership. Uh, and a kind of new form of regulation and organization of the space of the digital in, in the hands of kind of corporate um, forces. Now, I, I would even say something like the NFT, which is obviously all over the news today, is really the, the, the culmination of this shift, because what the NFT does, it reintroduces scarcity where there isn't any so you know you, you've now got the uh, an infinite image that you can copy and paste everywhere but a whole network of um, economics which have reintroduced scarcity into what should have been a kind of infinite commons so you know my my feeling about the potential of the digital to be part of a, a sort of international cross-cultural project of solidarity is because I still want to recover this kind of earlier internet culture belief that this um, could this 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 system of technology could have and could potentially still be this kind of commons a new kind of commons which I think we need um, but that does as you say completely circumvent the question of the body um, because it's by virtue of being a non-bodily thing that it can exist like this right it has to be something global something um you know which couldn't be um you know bodily uh, in in the sense of you're actually in the room with another body and seeing another person in that sense it has to be 
a, a disembodied experience. So it's a, it's a great question of, of, of what you raise. And I think it is a gap. I, it's something I can't really answer. But but I still believe that, you know, you can have that kind of commons. And I suppose I also would just add that, you know, we, I think we're going to see air travel, for example, almost totally disappear uh, for in commercial, you know, capitalism in the coming, you know, or really air travel will be the 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 province of the extremely rich so that you're already sort of seeing the, the collapse of air travel now. So I think it's very um, possible that the opportunities to be in bodily contact with people across the other side of the world will be hugely diminished um, in the coming years. So I think we will be in the bodily sense, uh, there'll be a great distance between people. Uh, you know, in the UK, I don't know if you've seen the same way you guys are, even trains don't work anymore. Right. The opportunity, you know, you, you, you're being forced into a much more local kind of form of life by the collapse of capitalism. So if we're going to combat that and still um, fight for a kind of international solidarity across space and time, we probably need to do that through a digital space, which in a sense denies the body, I guess. All right. Yeah. Thank you for uh, your actual discussion about this. And then I, we, I got, you know, the one question from audience you know, watching our live channel uh, Suham from uh, Suham from India so uh, technically I, I want to read you know this question to mm -hmm. Ofi uh, you are talking about structuring and reprogramming desire thinking about desire and how it has evolved under the apparatus of capitalism it will be interesting to talk about especially connecting with job interpretation hikikomori the horrific topos of desire in relation to spatial compressions. Modern desire could be interpreted to be something hidden in the obviousness and has lost its uh, dimension and reference points and in turn becomes in, imperceptible. Similar to Birelio's uh, tele, uh, tele observation with its absence of any immediate perception of concrete reality, would you say that the digital uh, portrayal of desire in social medias and video games producing an imbalance, which is uh, uh, something we need to understand in going beyond analysis of psychoanalysis, Marxist theorists, etc. Coming back to your idea of a reprogramming desire, would it, would it be okay to say you are hinting at the readjustment of desire or co-production of sensible desire and question whether I can... If, it can be achieved through technology. Yeah, mm. it's a question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure I could, could understood all of it, but um, yeah, I mean, exactly, it's exactly that. I mean, I think that some people don't like the idea of, um, you know, they. some people think that it's only the bad people who control your desires through technology, right? So it's only your Google or your Alibaba, you know, your Silicon Valley tech bros or your big corporate overlords who, um, but, but, but I don't think that. I think that, you know, good people should also be uh, operating in this way to, you know, control and, and change these structures of desire and so on. The problem of course, is that we don't have these the power over these technologies um right i mean it's very difficult i mean i don't know you're, you're all in such um different countries so it'd be interesting to hear um but you know in the uk here um some time ago um yeah i think we talked about this before alex um you know it was proposed that um yeah when we were talking about anti-communism it was proposed that um the state um, in Jeremy Corbyn's um, government would uh, provide a state-sponsored Wi-Fi. So your Wi-Fi would be provided just like your water or your gas, right, through for a state company, right? Um, and everyone in the UK was furious with this. They started saying the communists are going to read your mind through your Wi-Fi router and so on, right? Whereas, um, you know, if it's Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, they totally trust those corporations. So, you know, one of the problems we've got in trying to make a, I don't know, progressive, socialist, communist, whatever you want to say, uh, use of these technology is that we've, we've got a problem because people don't trust the state and people don't trust a public body. What, what has happened is people will enormously trust corporations and private companies. So they, there's enormous power in the hands of these private companies like Alibaba, like Google, to reorganize desire, to turn us into the, the desiring subjects of the future. 
And that this is what I think they are doing, right? So yeah, we need to do that. But first we need to like embrace the idea of it um, because you know, if we think only bad people do these bad things, then we'll just be left behind and have no power over the future of how people sort of think, feel, desire, and so on. So I hope that's a bit of an answer. Okay. Uh, so, all right. Just I think the already time's up, and then we, uh, you know, now the in the not kind of conclusion, but anyway, some kind of insight, you know, through uh, this kind of discussion. Thank you for uh, your, you know, the fantastic, you know the discussion about this topic and then your book, Orfi. And then thank you for accepting our invitation, and Manoj and Chumay and Jov. Okay. Yeah. So no, thanks, um, thanks so much. And I, I actually, it would be good to stay in touch. There were some quite a few things yeah. you guys mentioned that I would like to uh, read a bit more about. So uh, maybe Alex can uh, put us in touch and so on. I, I thought the questions and stuff were really, really interesting and made me think in a different way about quite a lot of things. Uh, so I've definitely learned a lot from you guys. Yeah. Um, so it'd be great to stay in touch and talk again. Yeah, what a, what a warm word. Thank you. See you, see you later, stay safe. Yeah, have a good day guys, thanks, yeah. bye.